What's up guys, this is Xander Bennett and this week for Halloween we are doing the top 10 Psychic type Pokemon. We'll come back with Cosmic Eclipse and probably Grass soon because we've already done Water and Fire. But because we are in spooky season for Halloween, we are going to be doing top 10 Psychic Pokemon this week. Psychic, honestly, is I think is one of the best competitive trading card game types and I think you could make a very solid argument that this is the top type. We started off this list with about 30 different cards. Obviously, some of them weren't as crazy, but just notable cards that were worthy of mentioning to possibly be on this list, and it was incredibly painful to lower it down to this top 10. Uh, I definitely think we had the most community input for all of Rare Candy on this top 10, so this is a really good representation of our collective thoughts. But let us know in the comments what cards you think are going to make the top 10 and... Uh, just what all your impressions are of psychic type Pokemon coming up as our first honorable mention And this might be a hot take if you've watched our top 10 fire type Pokemon I can see people getting frustrated with this one But you'll hear our reasoning as we talk about it is Mewtwo and Mew GX This is a tag team Pokemon which means that it is worth three prizes when it is knocked out 270 HP basic psychic type Pokemon with one ability and an attack realistically this card has many attacks You'll see why the ability is called perfection this Pokemon can use the attacks of any Pokemon GX or Pokemon EX on your bench or in your discard pile. You still need the necessary energy to use each attack. This means that Mewtwo just ends up being a Marshadow GX for all of your GX Pokemon. There are so many wild GX attack or GX Pokemon attacks that are going to be very strong with this card and have shown to be very strong with this card in standard and soon in expanded with uh, the Me Too, Vile Plume, Alone Executor kind of style deck that uh, abuse this ability simply because you don't have to put the Pokemon in play to use that attack. You just have to power up this Pokemon and use it. Um, the GX attack is also good, but it doesn't see use as often just because there are other GX attacks you're copying in this deck. But for Psychic Psychic Colorless, you do 200, and if you have at least one extra energy attached to it, you heal all damage from all of your Pokemon. So if you have four energy, you do 200, and you heal all of your Pokemon. The main reason we are talking about this card is the perfection ability. This card is a super all-star right now in standard, and right now in expanded, it's shown itself to be powerful in many different forms. There's a version with Mega Gardevoir, as well as the Vileplume one that I mentioned, and literally you can just jam as many good uh, EXs and GXs as you want with this card and make it valuable. Noivern lets you item lock people. Gardevoir, like I mentioned, lets you clear stuff off your bench. There's just so much stuff that you can do with this card. The reason that we have this as an honorable mention and not on our list is mostly because GXs and EXs are about to stop being printed. So this card right now is at its peak, and realistically speaking, it's only going to go down in future play from here. That It could still be very good, but in comparison to the other cards on this top 10, we know that the future of this card getting new additions to the deck is actually stopping at Cosmic Eclipse, unless for some reason they go back to a GX and EX mechanic and it allows it to be used with this card, which I wouldn't expect it to be at all. But Mewtwo right now, in its dominance, gets as many cards as it has in the card pool, which are obviously the most push cards because they are the ultra rares, but soon enough these other ultra rares are going to come in and start beating out the Mewtwo and Mew decks just because they're going to be stronger with the crazy amount of power creep that Pokemon is seeing. Um, outside of that, there is already a Mewtwo and a Mew on the list, so you can take that hint and figure out which cards we're talking about from there. But this makes Mewtwo the first honorable mention for our list. Coming up as our second honorable mention is Hoopa EX. This is a 170 HP basic Pokemon that's a psychic type. And the only relevant thing here is the ability Scoundrel Ring. When you play this Pokemon from your hand onto your bench, you may search your deck for up to three Pokemon EX, except for Hoopa EX, reveal them, and put them into your hand, shuffle your deck afterward. This card, when it was revealed, everyone was just like, this isn't a real card. You get to turn a Ultra Ball into three EX Pokemon, which generally speaking are the strongest Pokemon in your deck. Obviously, this card has a ton of power in decks like the Mega Rayquaza list that I broke out and expanded with, with the two different copies of Hoopa EX, which people saw as crazy. Uh, Mega Gardevoir decks later on when that card got printed also heavily abused this card alongside Dragonite EX, Shaman EX, and just so many different ways to keep this going. Um, Jirachi EX wasn't legal at the time that these were all in standard, but when those decks moved to expanded, which both of them did for different periods of time, Hoopa EX getting all those cards was a all-star there. This card also saw play 
in Rainbow Road because it could let you get a bunch of different GX, uh, EX types to put onto your bench. And also, surprisingly, in uh, Evital that Frank Diaz won a regional with back in 2016. I think that was the moment that people started to change their perspective on Hoopa because obviously it was like, whoa, this card lets you search for all these different EX Pokemon. But eventually, once they saw that it was just like a card you could play in Evital and you could use a Dark Art EX to retreat it if it got stuck in the active, it just became a really valuable piece of the deck that let you put an Evital EX, a Dark Art EX, and a Keldew EX into play on your first turn of the game. And so you have free retreat set up, you have both different attackers in your deck, and it ends up just being a really powerful card, not just for being able to get these crazy starts where you put eight Pokemon on your bench in one turn, especially in the Mega Gardevoir deck where they're discarding their bench every single turn, Hoopa's a big part of that deck, but just being able to get, like, your board set up and then you never have to worry about drawing another Ultra Ball again. Like, this is still something that happens today. If you find a Cherish Ball, you probably need to get like a Daedane or another Pokemon that you need to set up, but then you're still trying to need to find one of your attackers or something. So Hoopa just kind of lets you get all of it at one time. So Hoopa in all of its crazy excellence, just being able to search for three of the strongest cards in your deck comes in as the second honorable mention on our list. Coming in at number 10 on our list is Crobat G. Crobat G is a 80 HP basic psychic type Pokemon that is also a SP Pokemon, which SP Pokemon in this format were just a specific type of Pokemon that uh, were for the trainers from the uh, Sinnoh League games. Uh, they were very special in that they had certain trainers that would be allowed to be used with them that just allowed them to be insanely busted in ways that other cards were not. But we'll get to that here in a minute. Crobat G has the Poke Power Flash Bite. When starting your turn, when you put Crobat G from your hand onto your bench, you may put one damage counter on one of your opponent's Pokemon. Which, that doesn't sound like a whole lot, but we talked about Kingdra Prime in our water type video, just being able to put one damage counter on your opponent's Pokemon every turn. As a stage two, that really does add up a ton of math. Obviously, Decidueye had a level of success when it was in standard, with the putting two damage counters on something, and then cards like Greninja and Greninja Break have both been able to put damage counters, so really this math fixing helps this card out a ton. There's also Toxic Fang, which the defending Pokemon is now Poison, but you put two damage counters on them instead of one. This ended up being a lot less relevant. Uh, we are definitely just here for Flash Bite, as well as this card having Free Retreat, which actually was very relevant in this format with cards like Warp Point, which is just Escape Rope, and just being a Free Retreater when there aren't a ton of switching options. The main reason that we are talking about this card is because Crobat G is a SP Pokemon. The amount of trainer cards that benefited SPs were truly absurd, allowing decks like Luxchomp to succeed in ways that we had never seen at that time, just dominance for a deck. Luxchomp won Worlds in all divisions in 2010, I believe. Someone can let me know in the comments that I'm wrong, but I'm like 99% certain that that is true. And Crobat G was so powerful that it was played in lists that didn't even involve SP Pokemon, just being able to put this Pokemon down onto the table and get that 10 damage because you could pick it up again with cards like Poketurn. Poketurn is just a super scoop up for uh, SP Pokemon that you didn't have to flip a coin for. So now the ultra rares of this set have a free healing method that also turns into you being able to set up math whenever you want to on their Pokemon, as well as uh, for the Luxchomp deck, both Luxray C level X and, or Luxray GL level X and Garchomp C level X both had very powerful Poke powers whenever they became a level X Pokemon. So you could use these Poke turns in that deck just to complete maximum effect, um, and which allowed that deck to succeed. Outside of that, there's also Power Spray as a very relevant card for these SP decks. You can only play this card during your opponent's turn when your opponent's Pokemon uses any Poke power. So essentially, your opponent declares that they are going to use a Poke Power. Let's say it's Cosmic Power or it's Setup. They say they are going to use a Poke Power. Then you play this card. It says prevent all effects of that Poke Power. This counts as that Pokemon using its Poke Power. So they don't just get to say, okay, I'm going to do it now again. If you have two or less SP Pokemon in play, you can't play this card. So you had to have three SP Pokemon in play. But that was no problem for the SP decks that were just full of SP Pokemon. So Chromat G was able to help out those strategies because not only are you setting up damage, but you're denying your opponents their ability to set up and just doing crazy math and knockouts wherever you need to. So Chromat G, in assistance with all of these other SP cards, ends up being number 10 on our list. 
Coming in at number 9 is Mew EX. Mew EX is a 120 HP basic psychic Pokemon with the ability Versatile. This Pokemon can use any attacks of the Pokemon in play, both yours and your opponents. You still need the necessary energy to use each attack, and you never use Replace. We are here just for this ability. We're going to save ourselves some time on that. Mew EX, when it was printed in um, Dragon's Exalted, no one was really sure where it would find a home. Being able to copy attacks is obviously very powerful but with 120 hp it's just like this pokemon would die immediately and they would get two prizes eventually mew ex found a home in a selgor decks where a selgor could sit and play and mew ex could use deck and cover to copy that attack over and over again mew ex was also used in night march as a like a bigger threat which is hilarious because mew ex has such little hp but when your night marchers have 30 and 60 hp mew ex was one of the first ways that you could kind of increase that HP before Fighting Fury Belt was printed. And due to a reprint in Legendary Treasures, that those cards were still legal at the same time. Then Mew EX got a third printing in the Mew and Mewtwo uh, promo box that had some of the other full art trainers and stuck around long enough to be knocking out Buzzwell GXs in the Zoroark deck copying Riotous Beating or First Impression so that you could knock out those Pokemon. So Mew EX had a ton of different uses from being able to copy the attack of the Aselgore to sit and play, and you could just search for the one basic Pokemon to put down instead of having to search for an Aselgore and a Shelmet on your turn and a DCE, you just have to find the Mew and the DCE. And then the Night March decks use Mew. They use Mew in a lot of different ways, but when Mew was cut from the list because they had so many ways to use DCE and whatnot and not worry about what uh, like Seismitoad decks and other stuff were doing, that's when Night March was at its craziest. But Mew EX started being used in that deck alongside of cards like Verizian EX so that they couldn't Hypnotoxic Laser the Mew and they could still knock out the opponent's Pokemon. But also Manectric EX was a card that saw play, which you could use Overrun, or you could use Assault Laser, which was the main attack that for uh, one Lightning and a Dimension Valley, you would just do 120 if they had a tool. So uh, both of those strategies came out at Virginia Regionals 2015, I believe, by different players. I know that Nicolina Moon, Jimmy Pendarvis, and a few others, I think Jimmy McClure, were on that strategy of just trying to play this Night March deck that could also beat the Seismitoad decks because Lysander's Trump card was still legal, so if all your Night Marchers get shuffled from your discard pile into your deck, then you still need to have some kind of backup plan. And then, I know I mentioned all these earlier, but then Mew EX being able to give the Zorark decks a basic Pokemon that could answer a Buzzle GX, especially on their Beast Ring turns after they've just put a bunch of energy into play, means that they were able to fight this matchup that horrendously could have been very bad because of the weakness, but then you had a counter for their counter to knock out that Pokemon. So Mew EX just showed up time and time again because of its multiple different printings in high tier strategies, just as text for different matchups in the format because you could use any of the attacks of Pokemon you had in play. With all of this being considered, that puts Mew at number nine on the list. Coming in at number eight on this list is Trevenant from X and Y. Trevenant is a 110 HP psychic type Pokemon that's a stage one that has uh, the ability Force Curse. As long as this Pokemon is your active Pokemon, your opponent can't play any item cards from his or her hand. Then the card also for Psychic Double Colorless has Tree Slam for 60, and this attack does 20 damage to two of your opponent's bench Pokemon. Trevenant, uh, obviously a successor to Gothitelle with a very similar ability, or actually the exact same ability, just with different names, was a stage one version of a card that already saw a ton of play. Uh, I already hinted at a Selgor and Mew, but Gothitelle Excelgore was a deck that won 2013 Nationals in the hands of Edmund Kulos, beating out Ryan Sablehouse in the finals of that tournament. So Trevenant and Selgor was obviously the easiest way to see this card coming out and moving forward. Later on, the deck got very powerful additions like Wally to make it so that you could get this lockup as fast as the first turn, and also a really good Phantom that had Ascension, which means that you could evolve on the first turn of the game, uh, if you went second to still get a Trevenant out, so they would only get one turn of items. Later on, Trevenant Break would also come out, and Trevenant Break is worth talking about on its own. Trevenant Break is a 160 HP 
break Pokemon, which means that it goes on your active Pokemon sideways, and you get the abilities and the attacks of the Pokemon beneath it, which means that as long as Trevenant Break is active, you still have Forest Curse going up, so they can't use items. The attack for Psychic Colorless, which meant uh, an energy in a Dimension Valley, or Psychic in a Dimension Valley, was Silent Fear, which put three damage counters on each of your opponent's Pokemon. So what you would do is you would get item lock up as fast as possible and then just start spreading damage over and over again with this attack making it so that your opponent would probably just lose the game because they would get a pokemon lysander stalled up and you would just spread all the damage on their board or that they would just only have basics and they would die and lose because you're just spreading all this damage so trevenant ended up being a very successful deck in both formats and the deck adapted a lot between different forms eventually playing rescue stretcher so the deck could just loop trevenants or sorry not rescue stretcher rescue scarf so you could loop trevenants over and over again the deck is honestly very annoying but it is very good it's ended up with multiple top finishes did well at different states and i believe has won a few regionals if not gotten second at a regionals for certain that i can think of so uh, definitely be on the lookout for this card's success because it still seems like it can do well even though the deck has lost Wally due to the bannings in Expanded. Trying it overall with all of these strong factors ends up putting itself at number 8 on the list. Coming in at number 7 on this list is Gengar from Stormfront. And there are some cards that there's only certain relevant parts of it. Every part of this card is good so we're going to read the whole thing. Gengar is a 110 HP Psychic type Stage 2 with the Pokey Power Fainting Spell. Once during your turn, if Gengar would be knocked out by damage from an attack, you may flip a coin. If heads, the defending Pokemon is knocked out. This is worded in a way that it doesn't have to be the active Pokemon whenever it's knocked out. And someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe also that if the, like a Crobat killed this on the bench and then you flipped heads on Fainting Spell, you would still knock out the defending Pokemon because the defending Pokemon is just the, the title of their active. So... Essentially, if at any point this would die, you get a 50-50 shot of taking an extra prize card, which is insanely valuable on your stage 2 that already with these two attacks is doing great damage. So, for a Psychic, this Pokemon has Shadow Room. Put three damage counters on one of your opponent's Pokemon. If that Pokemon has any Poke Powers, put six damage counters instead. So this is one energy Snipe 60 on a stage 2, which... When there are cards like Uxi and Azelf in the format that have 70 HP and relevant Pokey Powers, this can very easily set up for some great math later on in the game with cards like Crobat G. Um, so, super interesting uh, ability here that also will let you finish up knockouts on the bench that you didn't get before. Um, and then lastly, Poltergeist for Psychic Colorless does 30 times the number of Trainer, Supporter, and Stadium cards in your opponent's hand. So, you have... A Pokemon with a phenomenal ability that's going to allow it to take an extra prize card half the time whenever it dies. A snipe attack for 60 on Pokemon with Poke Powers, but even the 30 is still relevant. And then Poltergeist, which can be an effective one-shot on these Pokemon because the HPs were about like 120 to like 140 in the upper echelon. So this Gengar was an absurd card. It did dominate through multiple different formats and when you look at the decks from um the top cut list Cursegar, Gengar with Garchomp C and Gengar Machamp are all different decks that were represented with Cursegar getting a third place finish at Worlds and Masters in the hands of Frank Diaz. We're gonna put the link to that article in the uh description so that if you guys want to read more about this card and what all strength it has you very well can um gengar was a card that was so incredibly difficult to play around because you had to get these knockouts and then kind of hope that the coin flips fell in your favor facing it so that your pokemon didn't knock out there were points that decks were playing multiple copies of unknown g which was a tech card that would actually get around the feigning spell ability just so that they could get around this card and type of effect so gengar was powerful in multiple different iterations and honestly Gengar was one of the Pokemon for a while that Pokemon just represented as one of the stronger Pokemon for competitively speaking it was one of their favorites to always throw out there but recently the Gengar cards have kind of dropped down a little bit but this Gengar definitely earned itself a spot at the number seven on our list just due to how many options the decks have that can present it Cursegar used uh, a Curse Gengar from Arceus which essentially was like a spinning turn style attack or a strafe 
where you could send up either a spirit tomb that locked out items or this Gengar. Um, the Garchomp and Gengar deck would just snipe on the bench so that it could take different knockouts as well as just have two very powerful threats in the deck together. And then the Gengar Machamp deck would just use Machamp to knock out basics and Gengar to knock out whatever else it needed to to allow the deck to succeed. So overall, Gengar just having so many viable options puts it here at number 7 on this list. Speaking of Uxie from Legends Awaken, Uxie comes in at number 6 on this list. Uxie is a 70 HP basic with the ability setup, which might sound familiar if you've been playing recently. It says, when you play this Pokemon from your hand onto your bench, you may draw until you have 7 cards in your hand. So, not only is this a one prize version of what Shaman EX was, you also get an additional card. This was a crazy amount of drawing potential that Dex could have, and luckily was only kept in check by Power Spray and Dex having Claydol to supplement their draw. But this was still a card that you would see alongside Claydol because the format had Super Scoop Up and other ways you can get rid of it. Or you could just use Psychic Restore, which for one colorless, you did 20 damage, and you may put Uxi and all cards attached to it on the bottom of your deck in any order. Uxi, not only having a great setup ability, was part of one of, I would say, the best Donk decks of all time. Uxi Donk would just draw through their whole deck and attach a energy to Uxi, and then the way that the deck functioned was that Pokey Power attached to one of your Pokemon until it's printing in black and white. So when you played Pokey Power, you attached it almost as if it was a tool card to one of your Pokemon. So that then what happened is whenever you played your Uxie down and you put all those on it, you use Psychic Restore and they all get shoveled back into your deck. So this really ends up becoming like one energy 60 so that you can put all this stuff back into your deck. The Uxie deck also played Crobat G as mentioned alongside very powerful draw items like Poke Jar Plus and Poke Blower Plus so that you could just take these huge amounts of damage outside and Expert Belt so that you could do even more damage whenever you needed to. The whole point was just to draw through the deck absolutely as fast as possible because of this ability that would just allow you to be so consistent. Outside of that Donk deck, Uxi was still just a staple until the mid-season rotation happened in 2010, so just a very strong card, just allowing for crazy amounts of setup for the decks that needed it. Um, decks that you can talk about with it were Gyarados, which used it alongside some other Mesprit and Uxies for different effects, and then Jumpluff used it so that they could just continue drawing cards earlier on in the game. So just you can just look through every list from the time that Uxie was printed and it became an immediate staple. So with that, Uxie comes in at number six on the list. Coming in at number five on the list is Garbodor, and we kind of cheated. I did put two Garbodors here on the list together. The Garbodor from Breakpoint and the Garbodor from Guardians Rising were both legal and represented in a lot of the same decks for a long time. So what does Garbodor do? Garbodor is a stage one Pokemon with different HP for each iteration, and it has the ability Garbotoxin, which says if this Pokemon is, has a Pokemon tool card attached to it, each Pokemon in play in each player's hand and in each player's discard pile has no abilities except for Garbotoxin. So when you attach a tool to Garbodor, the game effectively becomes no one has abilities except Garbotoxin, unless you find a Tool Scrapper for the original one, a Startling Megaphone later on, or a Field Blower. And one of the most dominant times for Garbodor was right about when Sun and Moon came out because Garbodor was legal alongside other very strong cards um, and there was no tool removal. Field Blower didn't come out until Guardians Rising. The Guardians Rising uh, Trash Lineage Garbodor didn't come out also, but there were decks like Glissopod Garbodor, Evotol Garbodor at that later ages that were still just doing strong damage and using this um, to back up the rest of their deck. Outside of that, in Guardians Rising came out the Trash Lance Garbodor. Trash Lance for uh, 20 times the number of, er, for one, one psychic, it did 20 times the number of items in your opponent's discard pile. I'm getting excited talking about all these cards. Trash Lance Garbodor became one of the staples attacking in the format as soon as it came out. If you look at the results from the regionals in Seattle, 22 of the 32 decks in the day two for this tournament 
featured Garbodor, whether or not it was Drampa Garbodor or Espeon Garbodor. There was also a Garbodor Tauros and a Garbodor Trevenant that had a Poltergeist attack. So uh, Garbodor just immediately came out and represented this offensive strategy just because decks were relying on so many items. And I think Garbodor from GRI is one of the cards that has changed the game for the better the most. And I'm willing to stand on that hill because it really slowed down the game with cards that were so crazy fast and forced them to think a little bit more about the cards they were putting into their deck. And I think that whenever you can do that in a way that's not like a control card or something that's generally not fun to play against, you really do change the game for the better. And Garbodor or Trash Lanch here just forced decks to really consider like, is it worth me thinning out these items or it, should I put these tools down so they can get field blowered? Or do I even play full counts of obviously good cards like Versus Seeker or Max Lixer in my deck, which not all decks did going into NAIC for that year so that I can be ready for uh, Garbodor. Um, Drampa Garbodor did win NAIC in the hands of Tord Reklev. Sam Chen made top four, and the deck had another impressive run at Worlds, not winning that tournament, however. But Garbodor overall just has shown up in so many different formats and different decks as just a strategy to turn off all these abilities and then with the GRI Gardevoir be able to just attack for solid damage. You could two-shot uh, relevant GXs and still kind of keep up on the price trade. Um, outside of the more recent iterations of Garbodor, going back to the Dragon's Exalted Garbodor, there was Big Basics Garbodor, which is a really cool deck featuring Landorus, Mewtwo, and Terrakion, as well as a bunch of other just like random stuff. So I know that a few people were trying like a Plasma Garbodor deck. Sableye Garbodor got top four at Worlds that year in 2013 in the hands of Dustin Zimmerman, which used Crushing Hammer as a way to uh, just kind of keep the energy advantage in your favor whenever there are cards that are so powerful like Dark Patch or even Raiden Knuckles attack on Thunderous EX. So just a really... Garbodor just continues to be interesting and I would dare say not unfair at any point that it has existed. Even moving into Expanded, there's been Sableye Garbodor, there's been Zorart Garbodor, handful of different stuff. And I think that it's a much needed check-all for the format so that since it's stage one, you still get all of your abilities for a turn. But then also it forces you to like, you have to understand that it's going to be a presence or you have to say, I'm willing to take a loss to the Garbodor decks. So with that being said, both of these Garbodor cards, or technically all of these Garbodor cards, if we're talking about the Breakpoint Garbodor Toxin and the uh, Dragon's Exalted Garbodor Toxin, come in at number five. Coming in at number four on the list is Sloking from Neo Genesis. Sloking is a stage one 80 HP Pokemon with the Pokemon power Mind Games. Whenever your opponent plays a trainer card, you may flip a coin. If heads, that card does nothing. Put it on top of your opponent's deck. This power cannot be used if Sloking is asleep, confused, or paralyzed. The reason this card was so dominant is because it received a mistranslation from Japan that was never corrected in English because Wizards of the Coast, who was who owned Pokemon, the game, trading card game, at the time of Neo Genesis, did not like issuing erratas on any of the cards. There are a few other cards that had minor issues that were never changed, but this was what I would definitely say is the biggest one. Uh, the Pokemon was supposed to be only able to use this Pokemon power if it was active. So even if it was active, they still only have a 50-50 shot of playing their trainer. And if it's Tails, they blank their draw step. If it's the only trainer they have in their hand, they don't get to see another card. They just get to see the trainer. And they have another 50-50 chance of if the they'd be able to play that trainer card, which is insanely powerful. But what ended up happening is multiple decks trying to get out as many slow kings as possible. And then your chances of being able to play your trainer would reduce from one half to one fourth to even one eighth because you would have to flip for every single one of these mind games effects. Sloking never received an errata in English and there are just so many absurd ways to break out that card though the most notable one that saw success was the Sneasel Murkrow Sloking deck that you use uh, Sneasel which could just do a ton of damage just based off the number of Pokemon you have in play alongside Murkrow, which could either make it so that they couldn't retreat, or you could just do 20 damage to one of their Pokemon so that you could just stall along the game as long as possible, and they wouldn't be able to play any trainers because of the Slokings, and you would just win the game eventually whenever you, had the, whenever you were uh, drawing the cards to win. So 
that sounds very silly and not uninteractive, and you're right, it was, if you thought that Trevenant was very good. This is effectively a Trevenant 50% of the time, and if you get more, it's actually better than that. And with this format, there was no distinctions between uh, what were now items and supporters and stadiums. All of it was just considered a trainer. So effectively, this turns off all of their items, supporters, and stadiums for as long as they keep flipping poorly to get through this effect, which is what made it so powerful. So Sloking saw lots of success along this, and I believe that both cards received... Uh, Sloking never received a ban, but there were different tournaments that did ban Sneasel from the tournament as one of the main cards going in alongside it. But then again, Sneasel was played in so many decks that that's another conversation and a hint for our dark type list. So for Sloking's just absurd power level of just being able to shut off everything that it saw against it, Sloking comes in at number four on the list. Coming in at number three on this list, and I don't think this is really going to be shocking to anyone, is Tapu Lele GX. Tapu Lele GX is a 170 HP basic. It's like a type GX, so it's worth two prizes when it is knocked out. And it has an ability, an attack, and a GX attack. The ability, Wonder Tag, lets you search your deck for a supporter card and put it into your hand, shuffle your deck afterward. The attack energy drive does 20 damage times the number of energy attached to both active Pokemon, but it's not affected by weakness or resistance. And then for one psychic energy, you can use Tempu Cure GX to heal all damage from two of your benched Pokemon. This Pokemon is absurd. Obviously just a great piece of consistency for the deck, similar to Uxi, but this card ended up having a grander impact, not just because it was in format for longer and it's been in standard and expanded, but also just because the attack that it has did end up being very valuable in a lot of the games that the card was initially released. I understand that if you've been playing for only about a year or so, you haven't seen Tapu Lele attack as much because we haven't had double colorless energy. But whenever Tapu Lele was initially released from that period of Guardians Rising until uh, Crimson Invasion right before Zorog GX came out, Tapu Lele was a very strong attacker in Decidueye decks to finish up knockouts so you started off earlier, in Drampa decks to set up math for Garbodor. Tapu Lele was just powerful in being able just to take these high like damage attacks for low energy costs and just ended up being very successful outside of the utility of it as an attacker you had the main reason that you're playing it which is the wonder tag ability to search your deck for a supporter it's a way that you can ultra ball and get a supporter from your deck so it just increases the amount of outs you have to supporters uh, exponentially when zorak came out we saw heavy counts of tapu lele come into zorak decks you could get Bridget, but if you go back to the Drampa Garbodor deck that I mentioned with um, Tord Reklev winning NAIC with, he played four Tapu Lele in that deck because not only could you just use it for Wonder Tag to search for a supporter under something like uh, Decidueye Ninetales Lock to help you get more stuff out, the ability to use Energy Drive as an attack was valuable. Um, Tapu Cure is not the greatest GX attack, but I definitely have seen it be used to uh, maximum effect to heal off two Pokemon that had taken a lot of damage. Different decks like Mega Gardevoir or Metagross would play one Psychic Energy because it's at no cost to your deck just so you could have the opportunity to use that attack. Ended up being very powerful. So Tapu Lele, there isn't really that much to say about it just because it's recent and it is a staple. Very solid card and will continue to be playable in both standard or in both. It was playable the entire time it was in standard and is going to be playable throughout the rest of Expanded for as long as it's legal there which I, there's no reason to ever get banned. I just mean unless they start rotating expanded at some point. So that puts Guardians Rising Tapu Lele GX at number three on the list. Coming in at number two on the list is Gardevoir from Secret Wonders. Gardevoir is a 110 HP psychic type Pokemon with the Poke Power Telepass. Once during your turn, you may search your opponent's discard pile for a supporter card and use the effect of that card as the effect of this Poke Power. The supporter remains in your opponent's discard pile. You can't use more than one Telepass Poke Power each turn, and you can't use it if this Pokemon is affected by a special condition. So this Poke Power basically says, I get to play two supporters in one turn, one of mine and one from your discard pile, and you're going to play supporters because you need to set up, and so I'm just going to have double the amount of consistency on my turns uh, as opposed to your turns. Um, then for Psychic Double Colorless, which started off as Psychic Double Rainbow, Double Colorless got reprinted in 2010. There was Scramble Energy that could power this up in one turn. There was just no shortage of ways to power up this attack. Later on, there was a Weavile that you could search your deck for Dark Energies and attach them to your Pokemon. So that was a deck for a while. 
Um, but Psychic Lock for 60 damage during your opponent's next turn. Your opponent can't use any Pokemon powers on his or her Pokemon. Gardevoir, very successful deck and stayed in standard for a very long time. The deck won 2008 Worlds in the hands of Jason Kozinski and then got second in 2010 Worlds in the hands of Michael Pramawat. Uh, two very different lists because the card had been around for so long that the deck list changed a lot. But overall, it's still a very successful strategy. You use Gardevoir to not only do great damage and lock their Poke Powers and doing stuff, but also you could just get so much more consistency from it. And then outside of that, there were powerful Gallades that uh, you could use to either put their active until they had 50 uh, and then switch it, or you could... Uh, flip over prize cards to do extra damage, which meant that you could take really big one-shots if you needed to. Uh, Gardevoir survived during a lot of different formats just because of the consistency that it has alongside cards like Claydol, and then you can just continue to outpace your opponents with these very strong damaging attacks that can be powered up very easily because every single format had energy acceleration of some variety for this attack for three energy. So with all of those crazy factors in mind and the absurd history of this Gardevoir just dominating the 2008 format and then still being relevant and coming back around for the later years of it being in format. Gardevoir comes in at number two on the list. Coming in at number one on the list, and sorry that I have talked for so long today, these cards are just so deep that there are so many different things to talk about with these cards, is Mewtwo EX. This is going to be a pretty straightforward one for anyone that played during the time that Mewtwo EX was a standard legal card. Mewtwo EX is a 170 basic psychic type Pokemon with the attack X-Ball, which for a DCE did 20 times the amount of energy attached to this Pokemon and the defending Pokemon. So Tabu Lele's attack was restricted for not applying weakness and resistance because of this card. Mewtwo, if their active Mewtwo had a DCE, if you attach a DCE, you could play a plus power or use a hypnotoxic laser later on to one-shot their Mewtwo. This became known very hastily as Mewtwo Wars, where you would just X-Ball back and forth over and over again and just take huge knockouts. Mewtwo saw a ton of play in almost every single strategy that played Double Colorless because of how easy it was to use and because so many other decks played Mewtwo, you were almost forced into playing Mewtwo so that you had a very easy way to knock out their Mewtwo's because otherwise they would just keep attaching energy and just continue knocking out your Pokemon. Mewtwo saw play... As early as 2012 in Mewtwo Eels decks, as soon as it was printed in Next Destinies, is the first set of EXs. Then in Darkrai Mewtwo, uh, in the coming set, which won Worlds in the hands of Igor Costa, but Darkrai Mewtwo just dominated that entire standard environment. The deck can Mewtwo continued to see play in um, Blastoise decks once Blastoise and Keldeo came out, as well as Ho-Oh decks, and there was also the Verizian Mewtwo deck, once Verizian EX came out in Plaza Blast. So Mewtwo just saw play with a bunch of different attackers that would be able to either put multiple energies on this or put multiple energies onto themselves so that you could just continue to flood the board with large amounts of damage. And Mewtwo became so dominant just because you had to play it to knock out the other Mewtwo's and just because it could do so much damage so fast. Um, it was a great counter against the Keldeo decks, which were putting a bunch of energy on their Pokemon. Even Darkrise, which have resistance and they can play Eevee Light on it, you're still doing a decent chunk of damage to to set up for other math. So Mewtwo EX, just with the crazy absurd strength that it has, I cannot stress enough how much this card dominated standard. I don't want this video to go on much longer because I understand that we've been here a little bit longer than I intended for. But just because of how long Mewtwo dominated the standard format um, puts it here at number one on our list. Well, alrighty guys, thank you for taking the time to listen to this top 10 psychic type Pokemon. If you enjoyed it, definitely leave in the comments what kind of Pokemon or card you want to see next. I believe that next we're doing Cosmic Eclipse top 10 for sure, but after that, we will definitely be looking for your suggestions about what cards to do for this top 10. But then outside of that, are there any cards that you think that we missed on this top 10? Are there any order changes that you see that you think that we should do? Definitely let us know those. And then Continue to support us by liking this video. If you enjoyed it, it means a lot. Uh, subscribing to the channel if you're not a subscriber. We are on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and we do have our own Patreon where we post special articles, post our deck list before the tournament, and generally just talk with that community a lot. So if you are really enjoying the content from this channel, definitely check out those things as well. 
But uh, my name is Xander Bennett. Thank you for listening to the top 10 psychic type Pokemon. I'm sorry that it was a long list. There's just so much stuff for psychic types that we had to go over. But it's awesome that psychic has been such a great type. So we will see you later.